Well, um, good morning. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Jesus Calderon. Uh, on behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, I welcome you to this uh, regional webinar series named Road Safety in the Caribbean, a safe system approach to saving lives. This is going to be the first session of five, and the name of it, of this is uh, Safe Speeds for Safer Living Environments. I remember you to be aware of the chat box where we're going to publish important information regarding the panelists and presentation. Additionally, we're going to have a Q&A session. So please write down your comments. Later, at the end of the event, all the registers will receive an email with the link of the recording. So stay tuned and let's begin, thank you. Speed is almost universally acknowledged to be the most significant risk factor contributing to road crashes. Traveling at unsafe speeds for road conditions, even if with, within established limits, increases both the likelihood that a crash will occur as well as the severity of the resulting injuries as the driver has less time to respond to hazards. According to a 2018 report from the Pan American Health Organization, the probability that a pedestrian will be killed if struck by a vehicle traveling at 30 kilometers an hour is 10%. If the speed of travel increases to 60 kilometers an hour, the likelihood that the crash will be fatal increases tenfold to virtually 100%. Good morning and thank you for joining us. My name is Alana Fook and I am the transport focal point for Jamaica at the Inter-American Development Bank. As we approach the holiday season, after a year of lockdowns and restrictions on personal mobility, today's webinar is the first in a five-part series about road safety in the Caribbean. And we will focus on safe speeds for safer living environments. As the decade of action for road safety draws to a close and governments around the world make renewed commitments to a second decade of action, the webinar aims to provide a forum for policymakers, practitioners, civil society, and other stakeholders to scale up implementation of the safe system approach to reduce the impact of road traffic crashes on individuals and economies in the Caribbean. Today's webinar was jointly organized by the IDB, the National Road Safety Council of Jamaica and the FIA Foundation. We are also being broadcast live on Nationwide Radio 90 FM and Radio Jamaica 94 FM. And I would like to say a special good morning and welcome to those joining us from Radioland. Throughout our time together, we will also be joined by an impressive cadre of international and regional experts and practitioners who will discuss the safety system approach as well as its role in the upcoming second decade of action, followed by a look at the approach to speed management at the country level. We will also be joined by a number of key persons within the IDB, including the head of the Caribbean region, the transport division chief, and the manager for infrastructure reflecting the IDB's commitment to improving road safety in the region. First up, to officially open our webinar series on behalf of the IDB, we are honored to have with us this morning, Therese Turner-Jones, who leads the Caribbean team within the IDB, where she champions an agenda of sustainable development in a Caribbean where people are safe,
productive and happy. Good morning and welcome, Therese. Thank you very much, Alana, for those uh, uh, opening remarks and for the welcome. We have some special guests that I first want to uh, say hello to, um, particularly our guest presenters, Dr. Melek Kisedek Kayazi, the Technical Officer of the World Health Organization, Natalie Drezin, the director of the North America Office and UN representative for the FIA Foundation. Dr. Abdul Bakmani, um, director of John Hopkins International Injury Research Unit. And our panelists this morning, um, Dr. Paris Luai uh, from Mona Geoinformatics Institute, Michael Saunderson, National Works Agency of Jamaica. Paula Fletcher, our partner in crime on this event, executive director of the National Road Safety Council of Jamaica. Um, and of course, all of my IDB colleagues responsible for transport who help uh, stage this event. And uh, again, like Alan is mentioning, a special shout out to all of those people who are listening um, for on the broadcast from RDR FM 94 and Nationwide 90 FM. Uh, special thanks to the International Automobile Federation for sponsoring this broadcast this morning and helping to uh, in building our public awareness campaign, encouraging people to be more careful on the roads. Um, thank you for actively being partners in this fight against road traffic injuries. From the IDB's perspective, we are convinced that this seminar series will be very useful for everyone. I'm sure that a new vision, ideas and commitments will arise from the discussions that we will have through these work sessions. And I also want to welcome, of course, all of the participants from across the Caribbean subregion who are partic participating uh, with us today. I'm going to just comment on a couple of things. What is the problem we're trying to solve? How can transport and development help? And some proposals for action. And what is our commitment? The World Health Organization in a 2018 study <clears throat> found that around 5,600 people died in the Caribbean subregion from road accidents during 2016 alone. For the subregion, this is the second leading cause of death for children between the ages of five and 14, and the third leading cause of death for youth and adults aged between 15 and 49. This surpasses the effects of NCDs, non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and breast cancer. So this is a staggering number. Together, this represents an estimated burden of approximately 400,000 disability adjusted life years. And what does that mean uh, for the Caribbean subregion? And what does this mean? This means that it's a number of years following a traffic crash that people live with a disability plus the number of years of life lost by the people in our region. Again, a staggering figure, 400,000. Losing 400,000 years of life and the associated economic contribution is a huge burden that developing countries of the Caribbean simply cannot afford. It also places an enormous stress on already fragile public health systems and a very high cost that strains our public budgets on average in the order of 3% of GDP per year, according to estimates of the World Health Organization. I think we will all agree if I say that 2020 is by far a very particular year. It has surprised us with a global pandemic that has transformed virtually every area of our lives and is leaving a profound mark on the economic development of our region. Even with the dramatic decline in economic activity in a pandemic environment, the numbers of crashes and fatalities have not declined in response. Right here in Jamaica, for example, as of December 3rd, just last week, 393 persons, 393 persons have been killed in a total of 351 crashes. This number is only 2% lower than the same period of 2019, but it's still a very large number. This calamity is likely to be exacerbated by the extensive damage caused to our road network by the recent weather events, as motorists from time to time will have to swerve and come out of their lanes to avoid the many and huge potholes that have emerged. I encourage all drivers, cyclists, pedestrians alike to exercise due care Take your time, plan your trips, avoid the rush, and travel safely to protect yourselves, your passengers, and other road users. Our public health system, as you know, is already under severe stress managing the COVID pandemic. Please practice road safety protocols to help save lives and ease the burden currently being experienced by our public health system. 
I want to pause to applaud the efforts of our partners, the National Road Safety Council of Jamaica. In their work, uh, you would have seen recently to train bikers in Westmoreland. We've all seen those pictures in the newspaper in recent um, uh, issues. To adopt safer practices on the road, including the wearing of motor vehicle helmets. It's surprising to me still how few cyclists actually wear helmets. And it's not just wearing a helmet, but wearing the appropriate type of helmet. I also wish to commend the government specifically, government of Jamaica that is, specifically the Ministry of National Security in its new policy, which holds delinquent motorists to account. This will ensure that those with outstanding traffic tickets, for example, are barred from renewing their driver's licenses, as well as acquiring fitness certificates and other similar services. This is another step in the right direction. However, we need more aggressive and punitive steps that can be taken to deal with the many vehicles that are on the roads without the relevant insurance, licenses, and fitness certificates. Perhaps further strengthening the laws to make for greater compliance could be another option. 2020 is also the year when the, when the first decade of action for road safety declared by the United Nations is coming to an end. Ambitiously, countries and organizations involved in development accept the challenge of halving the number of road accident victims by 2020. Clearly, Jamaica has not met that objective of halving the number of road accident victims this year. We are far from what we expected to achieve, the reduction to half of the road traffic fatalities and even farther from the vision zero approach through which no death on the road is acceptable. I am probably not the only one here with mixed feelings when talking about road safety in our region. We've certainly put a lot of effort and mobilized resources to improve road safety in developing countries. But 10 years went by and we're still in red numbers. But it's not all bad news. While the number of people dying on the roads in our region is still persistently high, we have at least managed to stabilize the numbers. This is the result of enormous efforts at all levels implemented by governments, with the support of many uh, NGOs, civil society groups, and multilateral organizations such as the IDB. Despite these efforts, the numbers show a stable behavior in terms of deaths due to traffic crashes. The number of crashes and the associated fatalities and injuries is still stubbornly high for both LAC, meaning Latin America and the Caribbean, and, the spe and specifically the Caribbean region. Concerning transport and development, we all know that transport is a vehicle for economic development. The coverage, quality, capacity, and connectivity of transport networks reduce poverty and income inequality and increase the quality of life, facilitating increased productivity and competitiveness of enterprises and increasing people's access to health services, education, employment centers, economic activity, and leisure, of course. We need to urgently rethink what mobility means in our region and move away from transportation infrastructure designed to move cars towards safe, citizen-centered, technology-enabled, integrated systems and services designed to move people and goods. Without the requisite investment in affordable, accessible, and quality public transportation, our transportation systems continue to favor the use of private vehicles, which has been prominent in the development of large cities in Latin America and the Caribbean. This trend has discouraged the use of public transportation and increased congestion and the concomitant air pollution. For instance, improvements in traffic management in the Kingston metropolitan area can reduce by 200,000 tons of CO2 annually. So this is something that we really need to focus on, uh, particularly as Jamaica and other countries around this region try to meet their Paris Accord uh, objectives and commitments. All of this, in addition to the already, already mentioned effects of travel accidents on the health, productivity, and economy of our countries, and our factors are combined to cause enormous effects on the quality of life of our inhabitants, especially in the most economically vulnerable groups. So what can we do? A major achievement of the decade of action with respect to the long-term course of road safety is the inclusion of road safety in the Millennium Development Goals. The integration of road safety goals 3.6 and 11.2 into the Sustainable Development Goals was a remarkable achievement with far-reaching implications. Agenda 2030 clearly states that the 17 Sustainable Development Goals with 169 associated targets are integrated and indivisible. This recognition places road safety on the same 
critical level as other global sustainability needs and clearly indicates that sustainable health and well-being cannot be achieved without a substantial reduction in deaths and serious injuries on the roads. The challenge is to expand their adoption and application, building on this achievement with the safe system approach and integrating safety across all sectors. The IDB's commitment at this moment for this region and all across Latin America is that no one should be killed or seriously injured while using the roads. The safe system views human health, life and health as paramount to all else and should be the first and foremost consideration when designing a transport system. Having the safe system approach in our agenda, we need to work on stronger regulations and, and their compliance, of course, but specifically on better and safer road designs, comprehensive infrastructure for all users, safer vehicles, and adequate speed management. Supporting this, the IDB has committed together with the rest of the multilateral development banks that we work with in an ambitious call to action on road safety for this new decade. We aim to support countries achieving SDG target 11.2 by providing access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable tra transport systems for all. Improving road safety for sp with special attention to the needs of vulnerable road users and seeking synergies with, another with other country priorities, such as climate action and resilience by expanding public transport. Finally, I want to share with you that as part of the strategy to support the Caribbean countries, the bank will launch next January the first English language edition of our massive open online course, MOOC on Road Safety, which will be available to everybody in the region. Previous editions have benefited some 12,000 people in the region, including government officials, students, and professionals interested in improving their road safety knowledge. We invite you to register and take advantage of it. Thanks again for joining us. We invite you, our audience, to participate, propose, debate, share, and learn. Thank you very much. This promises to be a very interesting day. Thank you. Great, thank you, Therese, um, for that sobering reminder of the enormous threat to sustainable development that is represented by road safety and the crashes. Um, now we have a message from Dr. Jones, Dr. Lucian Jones, who is the vice chairman of the National, National Road Safety Council of Jamaica. Um, and Dr. Jones was, um, this, is, this, this webinar series and particularly uh, having it before Christmas was somewhat of a brainchild of Dr. Jones. So he's one of definitely one of the key partners in making this event possible today. So we have a recorded message uh, from him, Sheila. Good morning. Santa Claus, do you ever come to the ghetto? A question posed in the opening lines of a popular Christmas song by the internationally acclaimed recording artist Fab Five. And in addition to it being a serious social commentary, the question statement is also a critique of the context in which we are discussing road safety in this historic webinar featuring the safe systems approach to road safety. This, as a disturbing reality, is that of the over one million people who die every year globally in road crashes, 90%, nine out of every 10 of them are from low and middle income countries. So the question arises, what has the international community done? What strategies and policy options have been pursued to deal with this scourge, pandemic even, which affects one set of people so disproportionately? Three initiatives are worthy of recognition. Firstly, at the pinnacle of the global decision-making process on development, the UN road safety standing on the foundation that is the safe systems. And before that, the pillars of the decade of action has been inserted into two of the UN sustainable development goals. Thus, hopefully providing the catalyst for the release of additional funding to drive the road safety efforts worldwide. Secondly, in the much heralded recommendations of the academic group for the third global ministerial conference on road safety held in Stockholm, Sweden in February of this year, shortly before the coronavirus induced lockdown, 
the chairman, Professor Tingval, wrote, and I quote, the vision for the next decade multiplies the reach and impact mm -hmm. of the tools within the five pillars and also extends the value of another critical component of the first decade, the safe systems approach. The vision recognizes mm -hmm. that the tools of the five pillars will have the greatest effect on safety when they are applied alongside new tools in a strategic and pervasive manner following the proven principles of the safe systems approach. Thirdly, these actions are resonate well with the decision taken to launch the Commonwealth Road Safety Initiative in December 2019, an institution with a mandate to promote the safe systems approach in the 53 member states of the Commonwealth, which includes most of the Caribbean countries. The challenge then for us who are road safety managers in the lower to middle income countries is to convince our governments to follow suit and adopt this novel approach as a policy tool that can unlock resources and save lives and reduce injuries. But it won't be easy. This is the sobering message from a recent landmark research project carried out by the prestigious and highly respected World Resources Center in collaboration with the Overseas Development Institute. Three cities were involved in the study, Mumbai, Nairobi, and Bogota. The key findings tell a tale. First, the conflict revealed in this quote from the report shared with those of us who were present in Sweden by Claudia Azazola Seal of the WRI, and I quote, yet for all the accumulated knowledge that the safe systems looks like, developing and implementing it remains an enduring challenge for many countries, particularly those of low and middle income, unquote. The key findings, road safety is not a political priority. They noted that currently road safety lacks political salience. It is not important. It is often subordinated to other priorities and is perceived to be in direct conflict with efforts to reduce traffic congestion. Politicians deploy their influence and funding where they think they may be able to get greater visibility and recognition from other politicians and interest groups and the public. Road safety is seen as an issue of personal responsibility rather than government inaction. Both decision makers and the public tend to blame individual road users for collisions rather than systemic issues such as infrastructure or lack thereof, weak regulation and planning or safe vehicles. As a result, they support short-term solutions and reactive measures such as a simple expansion of the road network which do not necessarily improve long-term safety outcomes. There is little coordination between relevant government agencies. Data is lacking. In the three cities studied and around the world, the true scale of the road safety problem is rarely understood and is likely to be misunderstood. What then were some of the key recommendations? Bundle road safety with more prominent or popular issues. Refrain road safety in the public and political debates. For example, road safety is a public health issue, but it is also an economic, social, education, equality, law and justice issue. For example, in Bogota, they established a link between the city's high homicide rate by focusing broadly on the issue of violence and avoidable deaths. Interestingly, this is the goal of the newly established Center for Research and Interprevention in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of the West Indies. Seek opportunities and build alliances at all levels of government. Don't wait for perfect data. So the road ahead, though literally and metaphorically filled with potholes and other challenges, 
is also one of hope and of promise. This is why it is particularly heartwarming that a major development bank, the IDB, has responded to the request, clarion cry even, for Santa Claus to visit the ghetto and bring relief from the suffering that the families of the over 127 motorcyclists and other vulnerable road users, the majority of whom are from the lower socioeconomic class who have perished on the Jamaican roads and across the Caribbean to date. And to have one of America's most prestigious universities, the Johns Hopkins University Injury Center, together with a global philanthropy, the FIA Foundation, join the party, is a major step in the journey ahead. Will the governments in the Caribbean step up to the plate and accept this gift of a policy tool that is a safe system? One which bears the name Vision Zero in Sweden, where road safety enjoys its greatest success. Only time will tell if Santa Claus, in the form of strong government action, as recommended in the WHO technical package sent to all countries, will really visit the ghetto in 2021 and help to prevent the carnage that is costing up to 5% of the GDP and causing untold suffering and grief among the least of these, my brethren. Ultimately, however, it is the collective action of those leaders in the Zoom link, those powerful influencers following on social media, and the man on the street listening to the live broadcast who need to bring pressure on the government to act, and to act quickly to save lives and reduce injuries, so that next year, we can all have a Merry Christmas and not a season which brings memories of pain and sadness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that message, Dr. Jones, and the reminder of the disproportionate impact, not just in developing countries, but also within countries on the, the lower income segments of the society. Our following segment of the agenda is going to feature two panel discussions. This first panel that's coming up now will explore the international institutional frameworks and commitments around road safety, specifically the safe system approach and the second decade of action for road safety. This panel will be moderated by the chief of the transport division at the IDB, Nestor Roa. Good morning, Nestor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alana, and good morning to everyone. Just to check, Alana, can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be invited uh, to moderate this important panel about safe uh, systems approach. Um, I'm sure we will have a great conversation uh, this morning because we have a great uh, group of panelists to do today. So let me start by introducing, first of all, uh, Dr. Maliki Kayasi, uh, who is the technical officer in, at the World Health Organization. Uh, Mrs. Natalie Drazen, uh, she is the director of the North America Office and the, United, and the United Nations representative for the FIA Foundation. And uh, Dr. Abdul Ghafur uh, Bakani, uh, who is the, an associate professor at the International uh, Health and Director of the John Hopkins International Injury Research Unit. Uh, but let me, before starting our conversation, uh, allow me please to set the stage in providing some context to this big challenge of saving lives that we should be not losing in the first, in the first place. As we all know, um, Latin America and the Caribbean are characterized by being the most urbanized um, uh, developing region in the world, the most urbanized region in the world. And along with other urbanization and economic growth, which is, uh, in principle, a very good thing to happen, the number of people uh, with need and means to buy cars and motorbikes has uh, permanently continued to grow. The result is high motorization. And why is motorization important? Because it means greater exposure to risk. Um, along with other big problems, uh, uh, as big as the, as the, as the losing life, uh, they are big because they impact human health um, and, uh, and they are big because they impact society. And, and here we are talking about increased pollution and congestion 
um, in, including in the Caribbean region, for example, the number of vehicles has increased by more than 100% in, in a decade, and the expectations of further growth are dangerous, uh, dangerously real. No? Uh, as a result of this situation, our cities have turned it into what we can say is, without any doubt, that is a unsustainable urban uh, development models that favor uh, the private vehicle over public transportation or any other means of more sustainable transportation. Very large distances, uh, low cost financing, and incentives to buy cars and motorcycles, and a growing middle class, which is good. All of that favors privacy and convenience over the more sustainable and, and affordable transit system. Curbing this high level of motorization will require investing in better and safer streets, which are designed not only for the motor vehicle, but um, uh, for all users. And, in, and, in, and, and where and these streets, uh, the space uh, should be designated for different speeds, different weights, different dimensions, creating cycle paths, and will encourage uh, active modes and emphasizing, and let me repeat that, emphasizing safe, but also accessible, affordable, and inclusive public transportation. If we acknowledge this challenge, uh, and in acknowledge of this challenge, the, the Estocolm Declaration of our Road Safety calls countries to include the safe system approach as an integral element of a street design, transport system planning, uh, and governance, especially for vulnerable road users and especially in urban areas. Under this new framework, innovative measures, which are coupled with, with technology, which I think is the great opportunity that our, our, our countries, uh, including the Caribbean countries have, um, we can implement a, a sound safe uh, system approach. For example, street cameras with artificial intelligent uh, software can enable the analysis to better understand the trends of uh, behind traffic volumes and car crashes, even before they, before they happen. No? Um, the, the use of algorithms uh, to process big data and prevent future indices and analytics to harness social media platforms and location data. As the technology improves, smart cars will be able to stop faster, turn quicker, and stay aware of their surroundings. So with this as a sort of a background um, context, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kajisi to give us his initial remarks and let me give you with one, with one uh, initial question for you. Uh, we, we can say with honesty that we failed to achieve the goal of reducing 50% of road fatalities by 2020, or was uh, uh, our goal in the, in the, in the decade, uh, and the numbers of road traffic deaths remain, remain high globally. So, Dr. Kayasi, what will be the key elements that the plan for the second decade of action for road safety, safety will bring to, to the table about the reduction that was not achieved in the first decade of, of action? Dr. Kayasi, the floor is yours and welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Roa. And I agree with you completely that the target that was sent, set for the first decade of action was not realized. I'll give us some um, figures. Uh, we are supposed to have reduced globally road traffic fatalities and injuries by 50%. So if we look at the 2011 figure, which was about 1.1 million, this was projected to reach 1.9 million by 2020. So if we had reduced this by 50, percent, it would have come to about 900,000 deaths. And remember in 2015, we had the SDG target, which was aiming at reducing road traffic deaths by 50% based on 2015. So this would have further reduced to about 650,000 deaths by 2020. But as you can see from the slide before us, uh, the report we have from the World Health Organization, Global Status Report shows that about 1.3 million people died in 2016 uh, data. Of course, it came out in 2018. So you can see we are far from reaching the figure of 900,000 deaths 
or 650,000 if we go by the SDG target. The question is, what can we do next? Now, we need to remember that uh, in the second decade, it's important for us to know that policy change in the road safety area, as well as other areas of policy is an iterative process. Uh, that means that in the second decade, we need to work more or less on the same risk factors, same interventions related to the road, to the vehicle, and to the user. We may also look at them from the pillars perspective of the safe system perspective. The question Mr. Rao is, is asking is quite important. What will bring about the change? Now, from an iterative policy perspective, we need to do two things. The first is to assess, evaluate what we implemented in each country. And the second is to identify problematic areas that we can improve on and indeed take practical action. So in other words, there will not be substantially new areas to work on. There are more or less the same risk factors, the same interventions, but it's the sustained reflection and actions that we take on this. I compare this to undertaking a physical activity program. You may realize you are not maybe uh, having 30, recommended 30 minutes per hour as an individual or as a community, but you start working on it uh, I mean, per day, you start working on it. Initially, maybe you will do 15 minutes, but as you review this, you begin on uh, finding out where do you need to improve. Is it the time you're waking up? Is it pu putting in more rigor? Is it practicing more? So the same principle applies to road safety in the second decade of action, that we need to continuously improve on what we've done and make it much better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kayasi. And, um, and it's a very, very concrete and very uh, specific the recommendation that you, that you make. And, and actually, you're saying that we need to take practical actions. And you talk about speed. And, um, and, uh, and it seems uh, the clear path to know. It also seems, and to continue with the conversation, it also seems contradictory that, that the, the, the mode that generates more congestion, pollution, and accidents, which are not accidents, as we all know, uh, we, as we all know um, is the transport mode of private choice, the, the mode that people decide to, to, to use, and that most people uh, like and want. That's the, that's the big issue with the cars. No? The cars is something that people like, and that's why we have the problem. But I'm sure that nobody wants to die or to kill anyone while they uh, make for their dream or, or requirement of having a, a car. So, so there is public policy that is required there to create the adequate incentives for people to not incure in something that they don't want to do. Um, so that's why we need to level the externalities caused by private car ownership. And one way to do that is to promote and execute policies such as congestion pricing or motor fuel taxes, parking, and speed enforcement, uh, as uh, Dr. Kayasi uh, was mentioning. Those should be tools that, much, uh, that will help and provide the needed funding to implement those practical actions that are needed to identify for this uh, second action, uh, second decade of, of, of action. So there is a path, probably a um, long term, to start to start leveling these externalities of the of the private car. Meanwhile, we need to work with what we have today. So let me now turn to uh, Mrs. Bracing. Uh, as you know, um, one of the of the cornerstones of the safe systems approach is the idea that humans will continue to make mistakes, um, and the transport system must accommodate for this and nobody can be killed because somebody wants to buy a car or because somebody makes a mistake uh, uh, driving a car. For, for that, we should implement a more forgiven road transportation system. And it is, is it possible to see a day when no one will die on our roads? We are having problems to count our fatalities and is, is, is it too much to ask for that? 
how do you think that uh, safe system approach could contribute um, in, to achieve this goal? Is any way that we can measure that? So Dr. Dyson, the, the, the floor is yours and welcome. Thanks so much. And thank you for having me today and for hosting this very important discussion. Now, before I talk about whether or not getting to zero is even possible, I wanna start by acknowledging the reality that we face, right? My guess is that you or someone you know has been in a crash. Um, I personally got that dreaded call one day when a friend was killed crossing the street just while she was walking to school. She was hit by a drunk driver. And that's when I realized that her death and every single death that you've mourned was preventable. It's not just that we can get to zero, it's that we have to get to zero. And as Mr. Roa said, crashes are not accidents, right? They're not acts of God. We know what causes crashes and we know how to prevent them. Now, my friend was only 20 years old, um, but she wasn't alone. And when you think about the leading killer of, of youth around the world, ages five to 29, what comes to mind for you? Maybe it's drugs or it's suicide, but actually the leading killer of young people is road crashes. And it's not just our young people who suffer. Globally, we lose more people on our roads than from HIV AIDS or tuberculosis, but it doesn't have to be that way. The only acceptable number of deaths on our roads is zero and we can get there. Uh, the answer is not self-driving cars. It's actually simple cost-effective solutions that are right in front of us. Uh, they're solutions that, what, that prioritize what we call vulnerable road users. Those who are not protected by two tons of metal, right? As you are in a car. There are pedestrians and cyclists and motorcyclists. And we can teach them as much as we want to safely cross the street or wear a helmet, but they're going to make mistakes as will the drivers around them who they can't control. And the difference between life and death for them is separating them from dangerous vehicles and reducing speeds around them. So a couple of examples of how we can do this is through footpaths and cycleways and infrastructure that forces people to slow down. It doesn't just nicely ask them to slow down. And in Jamaica, we're implementing those solutions with UNICEF and JN Foundation and National Road Safety Council and others to make progress down the path of zero fatalities. We're starting with children and we're providing them with the safe and healthy journeys to school that they deserve because this has benefits for the entire population. It's an effort that's part of a global movement to get to zero and it starts with the safe systems approach. So I like to compare the safe systems approach to Swiss cheese. Right, a slice of Swiss cheese has holes in it, but if you layer enough pieces on top of each other, eventually you'll get a block of Swiss cheese with no holes. And similarly, enough protective measures, with enough protective measures in place, we can make as many mistakes as we want, but we won't fall through the gaps. Those mistakes won't be a death sentence. All those layers work together, taking collective responsibility to build, operate, and use roads safely. I'm gonna show you just one slide, but I'll describe it for all of you listening on the radio. The best way to picture the safe systems approach is to think of yourself walking down what looks like a very safe street. So what do you see? Well, let's start with where you are, right? If we're talking about the traditional model of road safety, you'd be on a street that only has safety improvements because there's been a tragedy already. But with the safe systems approach, you're on a street that's been proactively identified as risky before the tragedy occurs. There's probably a traffic light and maybe there's even a pedestrian countdown and a crosswalk and footpaths to separate pedestrians from vehicles. All the vehicles meet safety standards. Everyone like the drivers and pedestrians and cyclists is respecting the rules and law enforcement is helping too. And there's something that you don't see there. There's emergency care that will respond quickly if you get into a, a crash. And on this street, you're crossing where you're supposed to be crossing at the crosswalk, right? Those are some of the behavioral enforcement and engineering components of a safe systems approach. But check out this next slide. And again, for those of you just on the radio visualizing, there's one make or break element that we haven't talked about here and that's speed. So imagine yourself again on this safe looking road, you're in the crosswalk and all of a sudden you see a speeding car coming towards you. That driver has made a mistake. It's one that I've made, that we've all made because speeding is far too easy to do. 
And all of a sudden you and the crosswalk are not safe anymore. The crosswalk might as well be a tightrope, right? There's no infrastructure to slow that car down and you will get hit. And getting hit by a car going 40 kilometers an hour is like jumping out a second story window. And as Ms. Fook said earlier, our bodies can only sustain so much impact and we're more likely to die if we're hit by a car going over 30 kilometers an hour. So look, we're talking about vaccines these days, right? As we wait for a COVID vaccine, we should use the vaccine that we already have to prevent these tragedies on our roads. That's speed reduction. It's the speed vaccine. And my colleague, Dr. Bachania will talk more about how we can do that later. The safe systems approach isn't saying that crashes won't happen. It's just saying that we can lessen their severity so that they don't result in life-changing disabilities. It's saying that every single crash can be survivable. So rather than fruitlessly trying to modify human behavior, we can anticipate human mistakes. We can take collective responsibility. We can shift blame away from the victim and instead work together to protect each other. And if we implement this approach everywhere, we will reach a day where nobody dies on our roads. And I also just wanna briefly add here that the pandemic offers a really unique responsibility and opportunity to implement the safe systems approach. Around the world, we're seeing cities prioritize pedestrians and cyclists and scale up walking and cycling infrastructure to protect them. This work is usually a lot harder and it takes a lot longer, but right now we have the political buy-in and we recognize the need to get outside where we can physically distance to actually stop the spread of the coronavirus. And walking and cycling more is good for our physical and our mental health, and it reduces air pollution, which is tied to the severity of COVID-19. Now, just last quick thing at the foundation, we've partnered with UNICEF to focus on keeping kids safe as they make the journey back to school. We, want to cre we created guidance with simple low cost solutions to protect children on their journey to school from both COVID-19 and road traffic injuries and deaths. And we also have a global database of examples of safe and healthy journeys to school during the pandemic. And I would bet that many of you listening can contribute. I'll put that link in the, guide, in the chat, but it's childhealthinitiative.org slash COVID-19. It's our chance to implement the safe systems approach and get to zero faster. Thanks again so much for having me today. Thank you very much, Natalie. And uh, it's been a, a great, a great uh, remarks and it is only acceptable zero deaths. And that's, that's a great statement. And, and uh, Natalie Dresen coupled this with big, this big strategic vision with a, a specific low cost practical action. She mentions separating, separations, separating. She mentions lower speeds. That sounds very practical and it doesn't sound very expensive. Um, separating lower speeds. Let me pick up from here to move uh, on to discuss other dimensions. Uh, I go deeper that they are, have already been mentioned by, by um, Natalie and Dr. Kayasi um, that are also important, not only for safety, but for sustainability. Because we, if we tackle both things at the same time, which is we, we are going to get a bigger share of, of, of people pushing and get and help us uh, to get there. No? So there, there are a space and a speed, very a space and a speed very closely related. First of all, I think that we all agree that there is some unequal space allocation. For example, if the model distribution and the public space allocated to each mode of transport were compared, uh, there are serious imbalances uh, that we can see. Individual modes like car, taxis, and motorbikes account for only 32% of the trips. Uh, they are given like 90, 98% of the space road, of the road space in our, in our cities, no? Where public transport and active modes, uh, which are responsible for 68% of the daily trips, are allocated less, less than 1% uh, and, 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 or around 1%. 0.8 and 1.2, that's simple. Um, private car ownership is here to stay. That, that's a reality. It's very hard to, 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 to challenge that reality, but we need to be able to adequate, adequately balance the budgets that make practical the public policy um, required to allocate that excessive car space dependence with appropriate measures to offset the high investment needed for individual 
transport mode. So to set the stage, let's look at the following video, which is about the space, the speeds, pedestrians, and that analytics, which we give you a view, and then we continue with 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 the uh, with Dr. Uh, uh, Abdul uh, Bakari. Okay, can we play the video, please? Lions and hyenas, foxes and chickens, dogs and cats. Since the dawn of time, nature has produced famous fights that have remained unsolved. In cities, it's drivers versus pedestrians. Move it! Oh, what the... The street is a jungle, and both specimens want to survive. But what do they think? Pedestrians also need the space in the street. Sorry, the streets are for cars. Who is right? How to solve this seemingly irreconcilable conundrum? Computer science and technology. Every year, more than 150,000 people die in road traffic collisions. This represents 11% of the global burden. Pedestrians account for 25% of these fatalities and the share rising up to 50% in some countries. Part of the challenge is poor, unreliable and dispersed data. That is why, in collaborations with the cities of Cochabamba in Bolivia and Bogota in Colombia, we use computer vision and machine learning techniques. To track vehicle and pedestrian interactions, road user types, vehicle speeds, near misses, and other key surrogate traffic safety measures. And what was the result? Low-cost traffic calming treatments were implemented and evaluated in two types of intersections. Analysis of the data from the video analytics tool showed that motorcycles in turns and roundabouts present the highest risk to pedestrians and that collision risk decreased by 13% in the four-way intersection due to slower vehicle speeds after the traffic calming treatments. Aha! Nothing like proper data to bring peace to the ecosystem. By using these kinds of methodologies, we can identify conflicts and effective treatments. Check out the full study and share your ideas about how video analytics and machine learning could be used to promote safe mobility for all. Okay, so I think that's that's a space fight, uh, and not actually a space. It's a fight for a space, and 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 it, in those videos, animals look actually more friendly than humans. Let me turn now to Dr. Bakani to discuss speed. Do Dr. Bakani, as you know, um, one of the main elements of the safety system approach is speed management, including, uh, but not limited to strengthening the, the law uh, uh, that enforces uh, and prevents speeding uh, or mandate maximum road travel, let's, let's say speeds uh, of um, 30 kilometers per hour in, in areas where vulnerable users, as Natalie was, 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 was saying, are present and um, vehicle mix in a frequent uh, uh, and planet matter occurs. However, there is the widespread idea that these policies, and that's what you get and what we get from our clients at the IDB when we go and recommend this type of, of uh, policies, um, that they create a negative externality such as increased traffic congestion. People, people relate low speed congestion. We are not moving. Uh, we are moving too slow, and that's congestion. What, what should be or what is the rationale behind these speed management policies? Is there any truth to that concern that reducing speeds in cities will bring more congestion? Uh, Dr. Bakani, the floor is yours, and welcome to, to our panel. Thank you, Mr. Rao, and thank you for uh, the organizers for organizing this very important webinar at um, this important time of the year, where usually in many countries we see as people travel um, for the holidays, um, an increase in road traffic crashes, injuries, and deaths. And that's, um, as um, Dr. Jones mentioned, and uh, the previous speakers mentioned is unnecessary and uh, totally avoidable. Um, before I go into answering your question directly, it's important for us to take a step back and understand how speed is related to road traffic crashes and uh, the flow of vehicles um, from point A to B in, in a certain city. 
Um, we've heard today that um, speed is one of the uh, most central elements when it comes to road safety. And data shows us that um, a lot of us do speed on the roads. Um, so we know that about 40 to 50% of people drive above the speed limit. Um, we also know that speed is a central to road traffic deaths. So one in three deaths, for example, in many um, high income countries, just to take that example, is due to speed. Um, and then we also know that increasing speeds increases um, exponentially the chances of a pedestrian dying in a crash. And we've heard those statistics in the introduction um, from Ms. Fook and um, the talk that uh, Natalie just, just gave. Um, so I won't go into too many details um, on that. But when it comes to speed, one of the things for us to remember is that speed refers to two things. One is excessive speed. Um, this is where folks are driving above the speed limit. Um, and that's obviously dangerous and illegal. But then we also have what we call inappropriate speed. And that is speeds that, uh, driving at speed that is inappropriate for the road condition. So for example, if you're driving too fast during um, heavy rain or heavy fog. And both of these have negative impacts on road safety outcomes. And we need to think about addressing both of those as we think about addressing speed. Um, we know that speed increases both the likelihood of getting in a crash as well as the severity of the crash. And so, and that's one of the reasons why it's a very critical component um, in a safe systems approach. We need to ensure that um, safe speeds are maintained to make sure that errors when they do occur, like uh, Ms. Drazen just pointed out uh, when she was talking about the pedestrian crossing, that they do not result in death or serious injury. Um, and the levels of speed that we need to consider safe are really dependent upon the presence or absence of vulnerable road users, the different vehicle types, what protective features there are um, with the infrastructure that we have and the protective nature of, of the road itself. So let us look at how speed is involved, um, what the uh, contribution of speed is with crash involvement. And if you can move to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, so when it comes to the involvement of speed um, in terms of causing a crash, there's mainly two components that um, we need to think about. One is the reaction time of the driver, and the second is the actual distance once a driver hits the brakes for the vehicle to stop. So. In this slide, and for those of you who are on the radio, um, I'll describe it. We have, you know, the, the bars are divided in yellow and red color. Um, so we can see here that with an increase in travel speed, there will be both an increase in reaction time as well as um, the distance it takes for the car to come to a stop or the vehicle to come to, to a stop. And that is to say that, um, drivers will travel a longer distance, even with the same reaction time um, due to their higher speeds. So when you think about reaction times, um, generally you can react in a second um, or just about there. But when we're looking at what the empirical data is showing us, uh, most response times are between one and a half to four seconds. And that means that the faster you drive, the longer you would travel before you react to an unforeseen situation. So for example, if a pedestrian um, uh, crossed in front of a speeding vehicle, it will take longer for that vehicle to come to a stop, taking into account the time it takes for the driver to um, react, um, put the foot on the brake pedal and for the vehicle to stop. And as a result, um, it reduces your ability to avoid that crash and increases the chance of hitting an object at a much higher speed, which is in this case would be a pedestrian, another vehicle, um, et cetera. And then the other side of the equation, as we said, is crash severity. Um, and in this next uh, slide, what we're seeing is, you know, the higher is the speed, the bigger and more, like, more likely um, the mess that results from it. Um, and the operating speed of a vehicle 
will impact the amount of energy that's generated when the vehicle crashes into an object or a pedestrian and um, increase the likelihood of losing um, control of that vehicle. So now coming to answer your question, when it comes to this notion that reduced speeds will cause congestion, it's important for us to think about what it is that really causes the congestion. It's, you know, when we're traveling at higher speeds, while the perception is that you're getting from point A to B faster by driving faster, the actual empirical data does show us that faster speeds will lead to much more starting and stopping, changing lanes, et cetera, weaving in and out through the traffic. And that is what really causes other vehicles to slow down and leads to congestion. Of course, um, involvement in crashes does um, lead to congestion. So rather than um, thinking in, in that way, um, and this is one of the arguments that's you know, usually used by people who want to argue against reduced speeds, Empirical data also shows us that reduced speeds actually will cause smoother traffic flow and thereby you'll be able to get from point A to B in a more efficient and, and faster way. We also ought to think about other externalities of um, reduced speeds um, that you know, have benefits on the environment and health outcomes. So for example, when you think about um, one issue that people may not necessarily often think about is you know, the level of traffic noise. The noise of rolling tires um, on you know, driving on pavement is found to be one of the biggest contributor of highway noise, which really increases with higher speeds. And there have been studies that have shown a link between traffic noise and health. Um, so with increased noise um, leading to negative health outcomes. So that's another uh, positive externality when, you, uh, when it comes to um, reducing speeds. Speed does also impact air pollution um, through the level of um, you know, emissions coming out of the exhaust. And you know, while this process of emission generation is complex, we do know that driving between about 60 to 80 kilometers per hour or even lower does improve fuel consumption. It's better for the economy. It uh, will lead to lower emissions. Um, on the flip side, we know that further reducing speeds down below 20 kilometers per hour will increase fuel consumption. So that's not also good. And there's, there's a happy medium, which is why a certain level of speed is usually recommended. So there's many studies that show that reducing speed has a multitude of co-benefits and therefore rather than focusing on the myth that reduced speed will cause traffic congestion, it's important for us to frame um, this message. Over back to you. I was I was on mute. Uh, Dr. Bakani, sorry for the technology unforgiving uh, technology that that uh, that's what we need in the rows. Please allow me to ask you to finish up. Okay. Um, no, sure. I'm, I was uh, just saying that rather than focusing on this myth of um, reduced speeds causing congestion, it's in fact the the opposite. That's that's true. Reduced speeds will lead to a more efficient flow of traffic and thereby um, you know, getting from point A to B faster, reduced fuel consumption that leads to fuel economy, economic savings, as well as reduced air pollution and improved air quality. And there's many other co-benefits of reducing speeds, um, which, which are out there in the literature that we can use to frame this issue. Okay, that's, that's great, uh, Dr. Bakani, and it's been a great panel. Let me just, uh, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with a very, question for the three of you, very specific. It's almost a yes or no question because this is something that I'm sure you have thought about. But we have been talking about from the very beginning of the panel on very concrete things, uh, low cost, specific things, practical things. And now this uh, last uh, presentation of Dr. Bakani was very clear. We are talking about math. Uh, we are talking about very uh, physics, but we are also talking about a mix of acceleration and speed um, likelihood, which is probability, and these tend to be nonlinear. And 
And we humans are very bad at perceiving and analyzing non-linear non um, phenomena, even if it's very simple. And we have seen that in the pandemic. You know, we, 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 we have been able to make a huge discussion of things that are not on discussion, no? and, 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 and there is actual discussion on that. So, so let me ask you very specific, because there are like two sides in the aisle, if I, if I can put it that way. There is one side, uh, most people, particularly in our industry, uh, believe that we need to get rid of the car. Sa the car is some sort of satanic thing. Uh, use, ownership, even thinking about the car is really, really something that is uh, uh, really bad. On the other hand, uh, we have a more accommodating um, view, which I think many participants in society, private sector, industry, uh, follow, the C technology and um, behavioral uh, sciences has a way to approach the system, like a more forgiving uh, view with the vehicle because it's here, it's, it's, it's going to continue to, to be here, and, uh, and, and we have to accommodate and, and, and go through these more technologically or behavioral approaches. So this is, this is, not, this is a very intuitive question, and, and, and I don't know, Dr. Bakani, what you view, Natalie, and uh, Dr. Kayasi, if you can give me just a very short response on that. I'm sorry for putting you in the corner, but this is a very interesting uh, view. Dr. Bakani, you first. Sure. Um, so that's, yeah, that's an interesting um, way to look at it. Um, the reality of the situation, I think, that we all have to acknowledge is that the car is not going anywhere, um, that the, the private car is here to stay. However, um, what we're trying to say, and I think, um, my, my colleagues will agree uh, to this as well, is to think about how we design um, our transportation systems in, in a different way. While previously roads were designed mainly to allow cars to go faster from point A to B, I think what we need to do is think about this holistic approach of designing cities for people. And that roads are not just for cars, but they're, they're also for pedestrians as well. So they're also for cyclists and people can travel using different modes and get safely from, from point A to B um, you know, in, in an efficient way. What the COVID pandemic has provided us with an opportunity to see is that um, you know, we know that motorization, you know, increase in private vehicle ownership and usage leads to increase in air pollution. And we've noticed and we've had data um, showing that reduced motorization is leading to improved air quality. The flip side of that is reduced motorization has led to decreased congestion and more opportunities to speed. And that in turn has highlighted the role that speed has in fatal crashes. And so I think we need to think about it more of a system, think about land use policies, think about economic policies that, that come into play as well, and design cities that really cater to everyone rather than just private vehicles. Thank you, Dr. Lovacan. Natalie, what's your view? Let's kill, kill the cars or accommodate them as a necessary reality. How do you see it, Natalie? Yeah, thank you for, for that good question. You know, it's, I'll start with where I come from, right? I'm, I'm in the US, we have a love affair with our cars. Um, it's very hard for us to break up with them. And we also happen to live in a place that's very car dependent. We don't have much infrastructure for walking and cycling. And that's the first step, that if we're gonna ask people to walk and cycle and tout the benefits of doing that, we have to make it safe. Right, we have to make it um, inviting as well. It's not just about safety, it's about do you have a bench that, that you could sit on? Um, are there curb ramps so that people with disabilities can use a wheelchair or a grandparent pushing a stroller can get there? Or are paths lit at night so that women feel safe when they're using public transportation? Um, it's about looking at the benefits not just of road safety, of getting out of our cars, but beyond that, right? It's about how much we love being outside right now more than ever. I don't know about you, but I need to get outside. Um, and walking and cycling lets me do that. I don't wanna be cooped up in my house or my car. And it's about the air quality issues that Dr. Vishani was talking about. Um, 
It's about how we can reduce um, violence and harassment on, on public transportation to make that an inviting alternative as well. We, if we are going to use cars, we do have to make them um, environmentally friendly, right? We know how to make cars produce, uh, pollute less. We know that they are delivering toxic emissions directly into the mouths of our children. And there are cost-effective solutions for that that we've been seeing around the world. But it's about getting people outside of cars too. Um, so it's about prioritizing pedestrians and, and people and cyclists. Enjoy something else more than the car. Dr. Piazzi, let me finish up with you. The, the, the goalkeepers are really killing me on the time. So quick response from you, Dr. Kayasi. Thank you very much. I think uh, the question you raised is very important. As uh, Natalie has pointed out, uh, we are in a situation of uh, on automobile dependent transport planning. And this is so ingrained. It's almost a path dependent in some cities as uh, Natalie has pointed out. However, there are other cities, there are other locations where the car is not yet dominant. And the question I'm raising is that uh, we need to think of um, the choices. We need to think of integration, multimodal transport planning. We need to think of enhancing the quality of the environment and accessibility. So as Natalie has pointed out, I think coming from transport myself, uh, we have not fully offered options that can be as attractive as the private car. So as much as I like to see people move out of the car, I also criticize myself as a transport specialist that we've not offered alternatives. The car is an attractive thing, it's a love affair. The public transport has not yet reached this level where it will attract the young people and the high income earners to that. So we can discuss this, uh, Mr. Roa, uh, I like writing on this. We can discuss it and continue exploring the options. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you very much for, for you, for the three of you. This has been a great, a great panel. I enjoyed it a lot. I hope the people had many questions that have been answered. Let me finish up with just one last statement and pass it to Alana because we are running late. It, the, the, there is a mission to fulfill here. Yeah, and I think the Caribbean can, can really benefit from, from adopting this, this mission to implement a safe system approach. We, we see that it's not, it's not very expensive, it's very practical, but it's clear, uh, and we get it from the last question, that it's not easy. So, so I invite you to that, and Alana, sorry for the delay, and the, team, the, the floor is yours, and you have a big job now ahead moderating the next panel. Sorry about that. Great, thanks. No problem at all. I think, the, I think everybody is enjoying the discussion, and it's all very um, relevant conversation, so I think we're making very good use of time. Um, so thanks again to, to Nestor and to the panelists for all of those perspectives, um, especially on balancing the realities between the love affair with the private car, but also the need to balance um, and design cities around people and make public transportation and walking a lot more attractive and uh, more accessible and safer. Um, in the next panel um, today, and actually the final panel, we will look at the approach to speed, speed management specifically <coughs> So this should be particularly interesting for our radio audience. Um, we are going to focus particularly on the role of technology, the role that it can play and the role that it's already playing in speed management. It's my pleasure to welcome our panelists for this segment. Uh, Mrs. Paula Fletcher, the Executive Director of Jamaica's National Road Safety Council. Mr. Michael Saunderson, the Operations Manager for the Traffic Management Unit at the National Works Agency in Jamaica and Dr. Paris Liuai, the director of the Mona Geoinformatics Institute here in Jamaica. So Jamaica's National Development Plan, Vision 2030, which we'll all be familiar with, recognizes that a well-organized and accessible transportation sector capable of moving people and goods efficiently, safely, and, and affordably is indispensable to economic progress. The Vision 2030 Transport Sector Plan also identified that the absence of enabling legislation to permit the use of, tech, of appropriate monitor, monitoring technology and lack of adequate support for enforcement of safe road use is among the key factors hindering the development of the transport sector in Jamaica. 
A critical component of enhancing the safety of Jamaica's transport sector hinges on increasing compliance with our existing traffic regulations. In the absence of coordinated, technology-enabled approaches to traffic enforcement and an efficient way to monitor the payment, motorists are able to amass vast numbers of unpaid paper-based tickets with virtual impunity, which has greatly compromised the effectiveness of traffic tickets as an enforcement measure. In Jamaica, reports of motorists having hundreds or even thousands of unpaid tickets have been in the news. In recent times, the Public Safety and Traffic Enforcement Branch of the Ministry of National Security has arrested individuals with over a thousand unpaid traffic tickets and issued several arrest warrants. The use of technology such as red light and speed detection cameras has the potential to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of traffic enforcement while also min minimizing the burden on the security forces and the justice system to tackle traffic enforcement and also increasing revenue collection and transparency by reducing opportunities for point of service corruption. So if it's okay with you, Mrs. Fletcher, I would like to start with a question to you. Um, the December 2018 passage of the Road Traffic Act established the framework for electronic enforcement and reflects Jamaica's commitment to modernizing the sector, but the act has yet to be operationalized. Could you tell us what the main challenges are hindering the implementation of the Road Traffic Act? And once implement, implemented, what do you think are some of the immediate benefits that you hope to see, especially as it relates to improving the effectiveness of traffic tickets as an enforcement mechanism here in Jamaica. Thank you, Alana, and good day to all our panelists and the audience in Radio Land. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying that legislative change and an effective, effective and efficient road um, traffic ticketing system is crucial. Any approach to deal, to deal with safety, particularly our safe systems approach. As you mentioned, the Road Traffic Act was passed in 2018, December 2018. And there are a number of reasons why we don't have it operationalized yet. So just go through the crucial ones. Um, it, the, the process of, of developing and passing, passing a large complex piece of legislation is of, in of itself very frustrating. It takes a long time because of large body of, 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 of um, provisions in any jurisdiction that you find yourself. Uh, we began to work on the Road Traffic Act in reviewing it in 2003, after having done the, the act for in 1999 for the use of safety device legislation. So there was an inter-ministry committee that was established in 2007 and they presented a draft bill to the cabinet for approval in 2011, near the end of the government's term. Elections um, uh, interrupted the practice in 2011 and again in 2016. And on each occasion, the new government required further amendments. So that's one of the reasons for the, the delay on those two occasions. The bill was finally approved at both houses of parliament after several months of debate. Um, it was approved in December, 2018. And I must tell you that while trying to convince the government of the best practices that we, need to, we needed to embody in the legislation, it was a, a difficult task because you know politicians think of the vote and their constituents and sometimes not the greater good. So it was a hard task even to get them on board with some of the provisions. But the bill was finally approved by both houses um, in 2018. And since then, we have been undertaking the drafting of the regulations. I would think that is pretty advanced, but um, it's not quite ready yet. And of course, we know the regulations are the details, just for persons in Radio Land, those are the details that speak to what the specific provisions of the, of the act is. We do not have a target date, unfortunately, for completion of this exercise. Um, and there are limited resources. Um, this is what we have been faced with over the many years. 
limited resources in the legislative drafting office, which in Jamaica is called the Office of the Chief Parliamentary Council. However, given the work done so far, we are, we're hopeful that the Act and regulations will come into effect during 2021. Um, we would love to see it in the first quarter because after the first quarter, even prior to the end of the first quarter, we get into the whole um, budget cycle. Then after that, um, if you get into the, the holiday, then you, know, you have um, a break being taken by, by parliament and of course the last quarter. So we really would love to see some action and movement on this in the early the first quarter of the next year. So that's 15 years in the legislative cycle, which typically in Jamaica is usually about seven years. So for us to take 15 years um, for drafting and approval is something else. Um, so this is not satisfactory by any means, and we will never know how many persons involved in crashes would perhaps have been saved by some of the provisions and best practices we have embodied in the, in the, in the legislation. Now, there's another factor um, legislative as well, tied to another, um, another act, where there are some provisions in the, the old 1938 Act that have to be put in the new Transport Authority Act, which is also being worked on. And that act is not ready to embody sections of it that we need to take out of the, 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 the old Road Traffic Act to operationalize the new road traffic act, because what you have to do with the new act, even though it's passed in parliament, it has to be repealed and replaced. So even if the regulations were ready, if we repealed and replaced it, the, the, the provisions in the old act that need to go over into this um, transport authority act would fall in the gap. So that's another thing that we have delaying, that we have another act that needs to be passed to include the provisions of the old act before we can repeal and replace. Um, the immediate benefits are several um, in terms of you know having operationalizing the, 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 the act. And I should also mention that even though the act has been passed in 2018, there are several operational and business processes that actually have to be developed. Um, the tax office, for instance, increasing signs that have to be put in the, the computer system, just to give one example. So we still have that step as well to, to take, to, to, to get to um, operationalize. But to go back to the immediate benefits, um, in terms of some of the provisions and modernizing the act, the ban on the on handheld use of mobile phones. A compromise standard, I always say, because you still have to engage cognitively when you are allowed to use your fingers um, to type and to even process, um, process information. Well, it's hands-free, so you wouldn't be, you may be doing audio control. Um, so it's not use of the fingers, it's really the cognitive uh, um, ability to do all these things while trying to navigate a very complex space called a traffic environment. So I always say to people, that's one of the provisions that you don't have to follow. Just don't use your, your cell phone. But the act provides for hand, hands free use. Um, video devices, we know that a lot of cars, um, when they come off the production line and they are retrofitted with various devices. I've seen um, taxi men watching your television uh, the television is on while they're driving. So the act says that video devices must not be within the driver's line of sight. That's a, a critical one. In, um, adoption of an international tire depth standard, that's a low hanging fruit. Um, that just is a matter of the Island Traffic Authority getting devices that they could measure the tire depth. Um, the novice drivers would be subject to ad, um, additional alcohol and speeding restrictions during the first 12 months. And that's critical because, you know, handling a car, even for an adult with, with experience, much less somebody who is recently um, um, licensed to handle alcohol 
and driving is, is just a no-no. Uh, the learner driver must learn for at least six months before applying for driver's license. Under the old act, if you could get your permit and you had contacts at the Island Traffic Authority, you could just go and drive immediately. But we presume that you need some time to learn to drive. So there's a six month period between um, when you get your learner's permit and being able to drive for your license. Um, there are new regulations regarding the transport of dangerous, um, dangerous goods. And we use the regulations from the um, UN, UN code for that. Uh, having a driver's license on a person while driving, that's one of the benefits that we fought for. Wasn't very popular, but um, the, the, the ill that we're trying to prevent there or the mischief is persons being able to say, you know, I don't have my license on me. And then the old act gave them time, five days to produce it. And we hear from the police that 90% of the persons who say they don't have their license and the time, they don't show up. What about the ones, what about the specific, um, as, it, as it relates to the, the traffic, traffic ticketing? Um, mm -hmm. So this issue of people are being able to amass vast numbers of tickets and still be able to re renew their driver's license, still be able to renew fitness. Um, could you perhaps give us uh, specifically uh, as it relates to that issue? How do you think? They right, should... right. They won't be able to do that any, anymore. If you have tickets, um, outstanding tickets, and you present to um, the office for, for dealing with that, the tax administration department, you have to pay up. Uh, plus interest before you can re renew your, do anything to do with your motor car in terms of licensing, um, your renewing your driver's license, the registration for the car and so. So that, that is a very important um, provision. That was actually the very next one. Oh, great. On list. Um, there will be other benefits, improvements in the testing and licensing of drivers. Um, an improved system for sanctioning owners and drivers of over overloaded vehicles, uh, driving at reduced speeds, and this is critical, in road, road work zones and as well as school zones. For the first time, we will um, identify school zones. Driving at reduced speeds, um, sorry, closing a loophole that prevented the operation of the demerit point system, another crucial um, point there, benefit, because formally what happened is that the law spoke to it, but there was a there was a gap that people would slide through and, and they, they had to stop administering the demerit point system. We right. haven't had that operational for about 10, 10 years. Okay, that's an excellent um, lead in actually to the, to the next question um, because it relies on the linking between a lot of systems within the government and the tracking of information between your driver's license, your fitness, um, whether or not you've paid the tickets and all of this communication and information um, that's going to flow between different parts of the government and how that is going to be managed to improve the, the effectiveness of ticketing. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe this is a good way to, to lead into a question to, um, to Mr. Saunderson. Um, just continuing for, for a second, the focus on uh, photo enforcement technology, particularly speed and red light cameras. Could you tell us the approach that has been taken so far by the government of Jamaica and what is the status of application of these technologies in Jamaica at present? How have they been, how have the specific areas for installment of these devices been identified and prioritized? Okay, you're asking a question of, of me or Mr. Saunderson? Mr. Saunderson, sorry. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I had a little difficulty unmuting the, um, <laughs> the mic. Uh, let me just say um, that I'm, very pleased that I was invited to this forum and I listened to quite a few of the presenters before me. And I've listened to and heard a lot of the same conversation in relation to um, reduction in private car ownership, reduction in speed to improve um, safety for pedestrians and so forth. And I think because they, you know, we, I work for the National Works Agency that deals with um, the actual implementation of these um, road safety measures. And we have to balance the needs between what you know motorists are for deliver of goods and services um, can rely on slow speed um, infrastructure basically. So 
it's it's always a balancing act between the traffic, what the traffic engineer has to do um, for the road safety advocates as opposed to what the rest of society wants, right? Um, but as, as it relates to the matter of speeding, <clears throat> speeding is a big problem in Jamaica. It seems like, like everybody likes to speed in Jamaica. I, it just seems to be a cultural thing. Um, and it cuts across all demographics, young people, old people, everybody likes to speed. And I, I've always, when I'm driving along the North, the North Coast Highway, I can tell within a few minutes that when somebody drives up behind me, he will probably stay about a minute and a half and then he tries to overtake. I mean, it's, for some reason, we seem to want to be in front all the time. So we're always speeding. I seem to be in a hurry. Um, so the, our current environment in terms of speed management is basically what most countries do is use speed limit signs. So, you know, speed limit signs, road markings and different measures. But all of these measures are basically static measures. And you can't get any data back from a speed limit sign. I mean, if you put up a sign and it, you, you can't tell if motorists, how many motors are basically um, complying. So you can't measure the compliance of um, speed limit signs or even caution signs as, unless you actually go there and put devices on the road and, 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 and collect data. So right away we realize that the static measure for the case of Jamaica doesn't work. It's very ineffective because, and it shows in the, in the number of fatalities each year that's related to speeding. So we, are, we have been strongly advocating for a new approach. Sorry, and this approach has to do with um, the use of technology, various type of technology to, to actually monitor behavior. And the focus on behavior is simple, that if you increase the certainty of punishment or that you're gonna, the violation will be captured, people will moderate their behavior. And, and these technology we're talking about have have um uh, let me uh, start this video one second these, these technologies have in fact proven um very effective in different jurisdiction and so in jamaica we have actually started in spite of the delay in the traffic act the new traffic act the technology um experimentation has already have been started and concluded we have actually installed speeding speed spot speed cameras at several locations around the, around the country um, red light running cameras, um, lane violation cameras, and average speed monitoring cameras. And from, from that data, we actually confirm what we anecdotal we have already known that Jamaicans like to speed. I give an example. For example, we had we measured speed in Negril, a section of Negril, and 30% of the motorists were speeding. In a section of going leading to uh, Montego Bay, 25% of motors were speeding. And these speeds were the highest speed that we measured was between 140 and 160 kilometers. Um, in Ocho Rios, 42% of the motors were speeding. And this is in a 50 kilometer zone. And motors were actually going um, 150 kilometers. So <laughs> we know that speeding is a, is a, big, is a big problem. Surprisingly, in Kingston, it's eight to ten percent of the motors that that do in fact speed. And but what is different about Kingston is that it's a small number of um, violators, but those violators have repeated offenses. They have like fifty-six times we capture them feet, um, speeding. So they are basically a habitual person that is speeding. So even though that's smaller number, they it's a small number. Um, Speeding, but it's the same persons doing the, violating the speeding um, um, uh, all the time. The the thing about the um, the, the technology, has, we have we have actually gotten to the point where um, we're looking at how how can this technology help in finding persons with outstanding tickets, right? So, the apart from capturing the the speed on the road. We had to take the second step to say, well, okay, there's an issue in terms of compliance in paying traffic tickets. As long as the traffic ticketing system was ineffective in terms of curbing behavior, then there needs to be a, a system that makes sure that if you have outstanding tickets, the technology on the road will find you. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, I can more elaborate on it. So the same technology that captured your license plate and we know that you're, you're speeding because of the license plate. But we can capture your license plate from two different points for, you know, for average speed over distance. We find that average speed over distance is the most effective speed management tool. Um, when we use spot speed, motorists become very familiar with the location of the camera. 
and they tend to slow down. And once they pass the camera, they speed back up again. Average speed over distance, um, you have the motors have to pass by two cameras. So when they pass by the first camera, the license plate of that vehicle is captured and that is timestamped. And say, for example, you have two cameras separate uh, at two kilometer distance apart. We can measure what the average speed is over two kilometers. So you can actually, you can actually um, manage the speed of traffic over a certain distance based, based on where the, the accidents are occurring. So this way, the motorist has to slow down because he knows that he's going to exceed the average speed by the time he hits the next camera. So we find that this is, this is what we're basically advocating to, for implementation in Jamaica, especially along the North Coast Highway, where that is, has been identified as one of the, the, the areas that people are mostly speeding. Um, typically, if you have 10 or 15% of motorists speeding on a particular section of road, that the engineers tend to leave it alone. But when you have 30% and 40%, that requires some other type of intervention. And so we know that in Jamaica, for example, a lot of the, lot of the rural highways um, experience excessive speeding. Um, for one thing, there's not enough police officers to, to monitor these roadways. And therefore, uh, they will, we have to go to the, the way of using technology because technology is sort of a, a force multiplier. The, the use of cameras, for one, the cameras don't require sick leave. They don't want vacation. Right? So the cameras are there 24 seven collecting traffic data, identifying the vehicle of interest that is speeding. So this is something that we know that, that has to be done and has to be done very soon. Um, we cannot deploy this technology yet until the, traf the new traffic act uh, comes into effect. Traffic act, act, act actually have in it the, the regulation of the use of photo enforcement. So um, as, um, the director of National Road Safety Council pointed out that there is no timeline as to when the new traffic act will be implemented. Um, but still, the, the data, the data that we collect, is very important to to share with other stakeholders, so they they in fact can um, use this data to 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 develop their own intervention in terms of road safety. Mm -hmm. so Thank you. We're on the right road. Okay, great. Um, so you make a good point about um, the cameras and the technology being somewhat agnostic. You can't talk your way out of a speeding ticket with a camera. It's, um, you know, it's, it, 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 um, it, it's very unbiased. Um, so in the sense of looking again at technology and how we are using it already in Jamaica, um, I want to turn now to Dr. Liu Ayi um, to ask what, um, so as you mentioned, Mr. Saunderson, the cameras are um, capturing the license plates. You can see who is speeding, who is speeding, sp speeding habitually. Um, but Dr. Liu Ayi, I wonder if you could tell us um, when you think about these cameras that are collecting um, not just the license plates, but also individuals. Um, and as we saw in the video earlier, where uh, looking at the interactions between vehicles and pedestrians, um, traffic authorities would be able to identify areas where there is a potential point of friction and be able to make some, some intervention to reduce the likelihood. Um, this is going to generate a lot of data, a lot of digital information and facilitate the use of big data analytics in Jamaica to improve not just speed management specifically, but traffic management um, and also inform transport policy more broadly. Could you comment on how this potential has been uh, already applied in Jamaica and perhaps what are the possibilities that you see for, uh, for the future? Thank you for having me, Alana, uh, and, and good morning, everyone. What Mike has shown really is the, the future. What we have seen is the, is the generation of data, the movement of, of analytics away from just fatalities and deaths um, to a proactive measure that's going to actually fully and completely support the safe systems approach, not just in terms of data generation, but also in, in, in operations, in deployment, in the selection of, of how you're going to, to approach uh, the, the, the safe systems implementation in Jamaica. I mean, right now, um, for those on the radio, we're showing a, 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 a dashboard of all fatal crashes in Jamaica. It's a live um, crash map is really is inspired by the Johns Hopkins coronavirus uh, dashboard, that famous platform that's being used all, all over the world. But it's something that allows policymakers, it allows operations, people like the police, uh, like ministry officials, 
It allows the media and the general public to have access to detailed information specific to their areas. Uh, it is the kind of information that Mike is using um, with his, ca his camera systems and, 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 and ticketing systems and so on. You have to understand that when you are able to, to drill in on particular areas, in the same way Mike has drilled in on where he selects the placement of traffic cameras, this, this can also be used to determine the placement of safe solutions strategies. I mean, right now we have, we, <clears throat> we have um, people speeding up on corners and losing control. We have people turning onto roads and then slowing down. You have to have systems that can accommodate unpredictable behavior. This is what I, I'm imagining what Natalie was saying earlier on in terms of anticipating human error. Um, I call it anticipating human stupidity, but it's something that we are able to, we, we need to be able to be very targeted in how we, we implement this thing here. Uh, next slide, please. What we are seeing definitely across the country is, is not, it's not the same thing all over. Different areas in Jamaica have different profiles for outcomes, but these are, these are fatal outcomes. 3% uh, of all crashes in Jamaica are fatal. Uh, about 25 to 28% are injurious. The rest of them are the fender benders that never really hit the hospitals or the, or the morgues. And um, we really need to understand that it's so much more than just deaths. And that's where the traffic uh, camera ticketing system and so on really help to arm us with the kind of information that's necessary for these kinds of deployment. I mean, in the, in the Q&A and, and the chat groups, I'm seeing comments about the value of, of, of human life and the value of, of a lot of these implementations. I mean, in Jamaica, we are spending around 21 million US dollars per year on, um, on road traffic injuries. And then, but the breakout of this is different. We're spending about $763 per, um, per case. But if, you know, if you're a cyclist, it's about $2,000. But if you're in a private car, it's about $600 um, per case. It is something that we have to rationalize, uh, not just from a policy point of view, but also from a fiscal point of view, from a planning point of view, um, what is happening out there. Yes. And then using that, we can begin to prioritize uh, and take it further. But you're going to need data to justify, rationalize what you're going to be doing. It cannot be a one size fits all uh, approach. Uh, the, the, the problem is very diverse. The problem is very scattered and distributed differently across the country and across the region. Uh, next slide, please. This is my final slide. Um, so what we really need to do is set some realistic expectation. We're using the data to predict stuff, right? Um, but what we, what we also need to do is to create forecasts that allow us to do goal setting. We need to, we need to use these goals for, for, for tracking, for monitoring and evaluation, all of these things that are absolutely necessary in terms of implementation, in terms of accountability and transparency but we cannot set targets if we don't have the means to achieve these targets. The use of data, Mike's data generation is going to be so important. Traffic um, uh, license plate recognition system allow you not just to track someone in terms of, of, of unpaid tickets, but also the frequency of movement across an area. Mobility of population is also going to be very important in disaster management and, and curfew enforcement and so on. But it doesn't have to be just a, a one-size-fits-all um, approach. Um, but what, what I want to point out to and, and to share with the audience is that we, 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 we set targets like, you know, the below 300 and whatever. We need to have robust mechanisms so that we can achieve these things. We, we, there's a statement in, in, in July of this year when we say that and there are going to be 391 fatalities in 2020. We're at 400 right now and there are 20 20 more days left in the year. We're averaging 1.16 fatalities per day. So it is, it is we're going to go over 420. Um, in, in July, I was predicting 415. In July, um, the government was predicting 391. We have to be realistic in terms of how we use data and to set these targets and move forward. We cannot keep using the looking back analysis. We use statistics of year to date. We use statistics of, of the of the the prior year figures. We need to we need to project forward. We need to stop the 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 the, the, the um the twenty odd people who are going to die within the next twenty days, and we need to focus on 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 how we achieve this. 
So it is something that is going to require data to, to, to both uh, prevent those 20 deaths from happening. It's going to require data to rationalize and justify how we go about doing this thing and which particular type of safe systems approach implementation we're going to take, take on and where. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions um, in the chat, um, but I, I think there's one interesting one that I think links very well between this panel that we're talking about technology and using data to, to predict and to look at patterns, but also in the previous panel, looking at car ownership and how that interacts with other road infrastructure as well as users. Um, is there a measure to determine whether a country has an oversized car population? Uh, Mr. Saunderson, could you comment first and perhaps maybe Dr. Luai? Mike? Mike, you're on mute. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not aware of any particular measure that um, correlate the, the, the car import policy with road capacity. Um, I think in most countries, there's a disconnect. Um, and in, in developed countries, the, the road network is fairly well planned, you know, with some 20 years horizon to, as to what the demand for vehicle, um, vehicle demand would be. Um, in countries like Jamaica, we, we didn't have a planned road network in terms of road capacity. The road network just sort of grew over time based on you know what's happening at the moment right mm -hmm. so the the car import policy was wasn't I, I said wasn't well thought out in terms of saying linking how many vehicles should come into the country per year as opposed to how fast we add capacity to the road i don't think that conversation took place mm -hmm. uh, the car import policy policy i would i would think was mostly policy driven or politically driven yes. um, in terms of every jamaican want to own a car they should be have the opportunity to own a vehicle and then the agencies like the NW is in a sort of a reactive mode, trying to, catch up, you know, so I was still trying to catch up. And you have policies, the car import policy again has been revised to make it easier to own all the cars. So, so and like, again, if, you, if, 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 there were, if there was a conversation going on, parallel conversation going on to say it, the road inve you know, investment in road, improving the road infrastructure with car import policy, it would, it would make a difference. But, there, there's, that, there's a big disconnect between those two. I mean, um, Alana, may I? Yes, just very quickly, we have, um, we're a little bit past time, but oh, yes, go ahead, please. All right, um, what, what is important, again, is, is the kind, and I see some questions in the, in the Q&A um, related to, uh, you know, how do we improve flow and so on. You know, when we start to look at the importance of our road network and, and, and the movement of goods, people, and services across the country, um, how do we uh, reconcile um, certain safe speeds um, and, 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 and flow and movement so we don't jam things up? And it's, it's always going to be a, 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 a moving target. We're going to always have to keep adapting. And there is no, there's no one answer to that question. Um, but again, as the country develops and progresses, we're going to need to be able to, to, to look at these things, but never taking our eye off the ball in terms of, of, of the lines we are trying to focus as we hit to zero. Yes. Um, okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Liu Ai, Mr. Saunderson, and Mrs. Fletcher for your time and your contribution. Um, it's really fascinating to look at a specific example and, of course, all of the practical applications of speed management in a country example. So we really, really appreciate your time. Um, there are a number of outstanding questions in the Q&A. Um, just letting you know that the panelists will, uh, we, will, we will be following up and we will respond in the chat uh, to your questions to make sure that we have nothing left outstanding. Just as a reminder that this series is going to continue in the new year with another episode on the remaining aspects of the safe system approach, safe roads and roadsides, safe vehicles, safe road use, and also po post crash response. We highly encourage you to stay engaged, to look out for information. We'll be sending information to all of you who have attended today um, about the next installment in the series, and we hope that you will join us. Now to wrap up, I'm just going to hand over to uh, Mr. Agustin Aguirre, who is the manager of the infrastructure department at the Inter-American Development Bank. Agustin, thank you for joining us. Please go ahead. Thank you, Alana. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Thanks. 
And uh, I want to start by, by thanking all the participants in, in this first ep episode of the series of, of uh, road safety webinars. Uh, the fantastic panel of experts, the government authorities, and our own Caribbean regional uh, manager for the commitment to this matter. Uh, I think it is essential, and we'll be seeing that uh, this throughout the, 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 the rest of the webinars. I think it is crucial that this instances of discussion with all the scale uh, stakeholders in this issue uh, is um, sought and is uh, active and everyone has a, has a voice. Um, this year we have discovered the tragic coronavirus that has produced a world pandemic that is killing people everywhere. And I believe there is a growing commitment from governments all around the world to tackle the pandemic and take it seriously. There is growing responsibility from citizens and there's an amazing response from scientists and industry that in 10 months have discovered the cure and have begun as from this week vaccination. So I think in, in, in coronavirus, we can be optimistic that even if hard times remain ahead, there is a solution at the end of the tunnel. We have not been as effective in dealing with road safety. Another world pandemic that is taking away from us too many people. And in this area where we have been working hard in the past decade, like Therese, I have mixed feelings and, and a little bit of frustration. A decade ago in, 2020, in 2010, governments from all around the world, the UN, the multilaterals and the private sector launched together the decade of action. And we all put a lot of effort and mobilized resources to improve road safety in the world. And here in Latin America and the Caribbean, we, we did so too. 10 years went by and we are still facing a, a crisis that is affecting mostly our children and youth across the region. And the, the numbers speak very clearly. In 2009, the year before the, the, the decade, there had been in this region 95,000 deaths. The target there was to half that number by 2020, and the half was not of those 95, but of the projected number of casualties we would have in 2020 uh, if that rate of growth continues. So if we apply the rate of growth to 95,000, in 2020, we should have had 154,000 deaths. Half of that would be 77,000 deaths. That was the, the, the target for 2019. We had 109,000. So we stayed, we only managed to half, uh, to get halfway through the original target. Instead of getting to 77, we got to 109,000. So those are critical number and Latin America still presents an increasing trend in the death toll from vehicular traffic, and despite all the efforts made. The death rate in Latin America and the Caribbean is of 21.3 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. And that has been constantly growing, though it is true in the last three or four years, we've seen a reduction of the rate of, of growth. But that number, 21.3 thousand deaths per 100,000 inhabitants, is 20% bigger than the world average. And it is 2.5 times bigger than the rate in the, uh, in the high income country. So there's a, a, a big way to go and a lot of work still to, to be done. Having seen that and having analyzed those numbers, I think we have to be uh, uh, to keep on working. But there are some things and some efforts that have not been in vain and some achievements to see. For example, the issue is now clearly in the agenda. Every country is talking about this. There is bigger consensus on the seriousness of the matter. And in some countries, it has even become a political campaign matter. And if this becomes political, then I think we have a bigger chance that it, it will become a government policy. Um, let me put an example. I was head of the road agency in my country some 25 years ago. Road safety at that time was not my main preoccupation. And I always had this uh, um, speech whenever we had tough accidents and, and, and bad uh, uh, data, I would always say, 10% of the road accidents are caused by the road, 10% are caused by the vehicle, and 80% by the conduct of the human. And with that, I managed to 
continue working in road infrastructure, which was my, my priority. I think this would be unacceptable today. I think we, we need to understand that we can no longer say 80% of this is the responsibility of the people because the people will continue to make these mistakes, will continue to speak on the phone while driving and will continue to get distracted. So the role of the government, the role of the authorities and the role of the, of the technology that we have is to have the forgiving roads that we can, that people can spare their lives uh, uh, even if they make a, a mistake. So this is the first issue. The issue is in the agenda. Then the capacity building. I think there's bigger capacity in the government agencies. There's uh, good uh, methodologies and technology to collect data. And then there's the promotion by sector institutions and road safety agencies to mainstream best practice. That's also good. Then there's the multi-sector approach. We understood that we needed a more comprehensive approach to road safety, and we extended our reach beyond our business as usual style. We now work with infrastructure, with education, with car quality assurance, with emergency response time, with a better technology and so on. So, so we've added the scope of the work that is being done and there's many, many more actors involved. Then we also have this uh, expansion of the scope of prevention campaigns into prevention tools. For example, uh, using the car insurance, not only as uh, a means to compensate damage, but also as a preventive tool, as a, as a means to introduce better practices in the human drivers or the, or, the, or the people driving bicycles or walking in the streets. Uh, we've also worked with uh, agencies such as the Latin New Car Assessment Program, the Latin NCAP, trying to uh, um, use the uh, quality testing of cars and the sa safety features they have into something that helps the, the consumer, helps the buyer of cars to use uh, better features as an attractive to buy better cars. So, so there's also work on that. However, the situation in Latin America is still dire and we need to redouble the efforts. And, and uh, this basically because not only we have a very high motorization rate, um, over the last 10 years, most Latin American countries have increased their motorization rates with an annual increase of 4.7%. Today we have, I think it's 210 vehicles per thousand inhabitants. Uh, this is lower than in the US, it's lower than in Europe, but it's still high and it's still growing. And the other thing that is growing is the, the urban uh, expansion. Mm -hmm. More and more people live in cities. So this is a, a, a problem. That I answer them, Chris. You can go if somebody have a question. Sorry? So, so, and, and so where does the IDB come here? We are, as IDB, are willing, desperately willing, I would say, to work with all Caribbean countries in this matter. We have an ambitious and comprehensive strategy on safe mobility that can help Latin American countries make a, a, a difference. We base the strategy in three pillars, safer infrastructure, urban mobility, and public policy. We try to reduce the, the, the scope of what we do to really concentrate on a few issues that might make a difference. And uh, uh, we are willing and happy to, to work. How do we work? We use our existing portfolio, uh, which includes uh, um, road projects in many of the Caribbean countries. We, um, we provide technical assistance. We use the network of experts and, and national road safety authorities from all the region that we can use to help. And we have this fantastic set of, of partners, the uh, FIA, the IRAP, the Latin NCAP, which can consolidate and, and, and group a set of tools that is useful. So I want to thank you all for the participation again, invite you to reach us and our transport specialists in each of your countries to let us help and participate on improving road safety in the Caribbean. And I really look forward to this uh, continued work and to the next, uh, um, webinars that we will be holding in the coming months. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Agustin.
can close the event. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.